You are listening to Hungry Books, a podcast about the best books ever written on the subject of food. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook and author. And each episode, I present a book that will change your life. Hungry Books a somehow perpetual obsession of any form of life on this planet, we humans included, is to secure our own existence. And at its most basic expression, that means, well, having food to eat. Some of the most significant pivotal moments of the history of mankind have been a consequence of our need to ensure a food supply. After the Second World War, and the many challenges that our planet and our societies have faced, governments worldwide have food policies, production and distribution of food at the core of the most pressing needs and demands they face. And no doubt we've made huge progress in terms of making food accessible to the vast majority of people on this planet. But in the last 60 years or so, we have experienced some of the most profound changes in the way we eat. And as Wilson says, these challenges are written on the land, on our bodies and our plates. And we are just beginning to understand and study the consequences that this food system of ours means for the centuries to come. The way we eat now, strategies for eating in a world of change, is really a masterclass in food studies, consumption habits, and an introduction to food policies and food economics. Now, bear in mind that this book is not one that will ease your mind and tell you that everything is fine, because actually it's uncomfortably relentless at providing hard evidence about how little control we have on our lives and the way politics and economics rule our world, our plates and our health. But it also gives compelling arguments, examples and clarity to reclaim whatever room we have to foster our ability to take upon ourselves the responsibility to develop new skills, learn how to feed ourselves and take pleasure in foods that are actually good for us. Now, there is some crisscross along this book because Wilson takes the trouble to make an exhausting revision of the most relevant uh, contemporaneous literature on the subjects she covers. So you will find yourself adding a few more books on your list as you read along. So it is actually a gift that keeps on giving. Now, I just want to say thank you for bearing with me on this little hiatus because I know it's been podcast years since the last episode. But believe me when I say that reading, documenting, writing and juggling 20 other things is a proper art form. But I am thrilled to be again behind the microphone. You can show your love and support for this show and my work by sharing this podcast, giving me a five-star rating, getting the books I feature using the links on this episode's description, and you can even buy me a virtual cup of coffee via buymeacoffee.com. And all the links are on this episode's notes, of course. So on with the show! <laughs> There is a scary amount of information and noise going around about food trends, fads, miracle weight loss diets, food philosophies, health gurus, you name it. And they not only populate the bookshelves, but also the television screen, YouTube, and virtually every social media platform. There are many problems with that, but perhaps the biggest one is the limits of our own food literacy and our ability or inability to differentiate what is really useful and what is not. This book feels like a fool and a proper crusade. I mean, this woman is clearly on a mission to raise awareness, educate and give us the ultimate gift of knowledge and informed opinion. 
So in case you've never heard before about Bill Wilson, let me tell you first that Dr. Wilson is a journalist, researcher and author. And if you think that a PhD in French utopian socialism won't get you far in life, well, think again. Because after finding her, I guess, true passion in food writing, she has published a string of highly praised books, including First Bite, How We Learn to Eat, This is not a diet book, a user's guide to eating well. Consider the fork, a history of how we cook and eat. Sandwich, a global history. Swindled, the dark history of food fraud from poisoned candy to counterfeit coffee. And The Hive, the story of the honeybee and us. And she's also written a string of articles, papers and pieces for the New Statesman, uh, the Sunday Telegraph's Stella magazine and The Guardian. She is also a member of the charity The Sustainable Food Trust, based in England, and is the chair of the Oxford Symposium on Food and Cookery, which incidentally has a podcast with short and clever episodes. And I will leave links for you to read more about her her books and her work and of course of this amazing podcast. Wilson has also received mountains of awards and was named Food Writer of the Year and that was an award given by the Guild of Food Writers. Plus she has three children while I still complain that my day hasn't enough hours. So the structure of the way we eat now leaves no stone unturned and takes no hostages. It begins with the dawn of our food systems, with the hunter-gatherers, where we are introduced to the premise of the book, which is that to have a serious conversation about the future of our food resources and make decisions about our food that are good for our health, our planet, and make social, economic, and political sense, but we actually need to stop talking about food exclusively as an amusing uh, leisure activity. And we better start understanding now how we achieved such imbalance in our bodies, our health and our food policies that are making us sick and ultimately, well, they are killing us. (laughs) I know, it's a light Sunday reading, but it gets even better. The book is divided into nine chapters that cover the evolution of food and the global impact of food commodities and, you know, our overall decisions. She also explores the disparities of food scarcity, malnutrition, obesity and the obsession with superfoods and diets. The third chapter is on the relationship between health and consumption and how multinational corporations shape our perceptions on what is good to eat and the food choices we make. Next, B goes on talking about how the changes in our work habits productivity and cultural stereotypes impact the way we prioritize the time we dedicate to think, plan, source, prepare and consume food. Halfway in the book, the author turns to the downside of having a global pantry and access to off-season foods and ingredients from around the world, and the consequences of having, well, too many choices that are conveniently presented to seem healthy. On chapter 6, we are introduced to the consequences that shifting from a local to an economy of scale meant. That is, stop interacting with people when buying at markets and switching to shopping at supermarkets, which are impersonal and maybe we are victims of our own lack of self-control. The next section continues the discussion about how technology has freed us from the horrifying prospect of walking down to buy our own food and the many ramifications that delivery services have and that having unlimited access to all types of food all day is not necessarily a good thing. The flip side of that is presented on chapter 7, and that is the growing interest on vegan, vegetarian and other food choices and diets that can be as extreme as even removing cooking and chewing, which of course can be a dream for some and an apocalyptic scenario for others. Chapter 8 slowly gets us ready to start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and realize that our choices don't have to lead to a black and white scenario. 
and she actually questions Michael Pollan and the premise of the very book I reviewed on the last episode. And, you know, in fact, I agree with her on the point that he makes about no one cooks anymore, because Wilson, on the other hand, proves that if we are trying to educate people, well, we need to be better observers of the changes in habits and negotiations around our modern lives. And I will go and expand on this point further on this episode. And finally, the last chapter, which makes a great reflection on the book itself as Wilson gathers her thoughts on what she sees as the key aspects that are necessary to be more aware of the way we eat, it's pretty much based on a behavioral change, one that can only be strengthened with information, confidence, and pretty much stop pretending that individualism is the only way forward. Because if we are to survive and leave a process prosperous planet behind for future generations, we better start acting now. Now, an observation about this book is that while B. Wilson makes every effort to be very objective, scientific and rigorous to challenge her own perceptions and present a very well-documented book in which we find quotes from authorities, authors, cooks and anyone who has contributed to the discussions she presents. Well, the book is written from a Western perspective. This is a view of the world from the comforts of lovely Cambridge in England. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing deliberately biased, I think, on her tune and observations. But she inevitably has a very specific experience of the world and the way she dimensions and analyzes things well, are influenced by that. Now, why do I say this? Because I think that is really what makes books and research so special. Because we can see and read beyond the work and meet the actual personality, opinion and drive of the authors, we turn, you know, to broaden our understanding of the world and in this case, well, to be better at fooding. So it's good to know where they're coming from. And having said all of that, I think we better start getting through my findings and revision of this little jewel with teeth. I found very provocative that B goes straight to address the behavioral and psychological conditions that have made us largely responsible for the way we are overfeeding and undernourishing ourselves, and why food these days is all about lifestyle and philosophy, comfort and lust, but really not too much about being smart, responsible and measured. But I have to say that she really doesn't guilt trip the reader. Actually, she goes back to the origin of our hunger and how we have historically addressed this need to eat. Because it was a survival imperative for the early humans to remain hungry and make it a priority of their whole existence, technology and social organization to revolve around sourcing food. And more specifically, that type of food that contained a lot of fats, carbohydrates and proteins. And really, that's the whole reason why our bodies have evolved to respond to those sources of food. And that's what we crave for them. We are the descendants of hunters. And whether we like it or not, it is imprinted in our DNA. Now, of course, we also possess a prodigious intelligence and a big, big brain that is still coming to terms with the fact that our reality, or at least the reality of some nations in the world, is one where there is plenty to eat. And if we carry on eating anything in front of us, like is going to grow legs and run, well, we will end up overfeeding and harming ourselves. B. Wilson has a big beef against junk food, specifically the way it's been historically shoved on our faces until we have convinced ourselves that it is inconsequential if we eat three or five junk foods a day because they are so tasty and appealing and sure they can't be bad. 
And the real wicked consequence is that there are millions of people who embrace these products at a great cost and develop diseases and obesity. And in exchange, the only thing they get from the media, corporations and people is shaming and humiliation and blaming the problem on their individual choices. Now, while the book doesn't really demonize individual executives, it does call out on only profit-driven objectives of companies that are, in many cases, well, morally blind. Now, the thing is that while we figure out who to blame for this mess, never than before in our history, we have become permanently angry and polarized, vilifying and shaming each other for our food and dietary choices. And in the middle of that, there is a whole new set of market niches to be exploited with an array of products, books and trends that are just, well, as dysfunctional as the very thing they're trying to fix. An excellent point that Wilson makes is how brands make no distinction in the way they equally advertise food porn and green food all in the same Instagram feed. How can people trust or be guided by such double standards? No wonder why we have no clue of how to balance our choices. And one of the problems in which we find ourselves is that in other times, we would have simply looked back at what previous generations got right and tried to return to it. But it seems, at least for many parts of the world, especially the heavily industrialized countries, that, well, that ship has sailed and there is no turning back. As the author puts it, while a critical mass of consumers seems to be ready to create new ways of eating that actually make sense for our modern life, it is fair to accept that very little about how we eat now would have been considered normal a generation ago. So really looking back is not that helpful. It is almost evident at this point that change must occur on both ends of the food system, the way of producing food and the way we choose to eat. So it's not about simply changing our appetites. The food transition. For the uninitiated in food studies, we are presented with a very useful way to see the evolution of our food systems. And they are divided into five stages. The first is the hunter-gatherer and how they had a huge calorie expense in their daily activities, just simply by trying to hunt and forage and source their food. The second stage came with the agricultural revolution and the transition from a nomadic to a sedentary life. And that's pretty much when starchy cereals became the base of our diets around the world and cooked food that is with fire and utensils made their grand debut. The third stage is the glory days of farming, diversity of crops and maximizing production, which meant less dependence on starchy grains and having more greens, fruits and vegetables. This also meant the mechanization of agriculture and food production, along with the transition to an urban and more sedentary life and the advent of processed food, bigger intake of fats, sugars, and much less fiber, ironic. Stage four, which is pretty much where we are stuck, is the shaping of a standard global diet, the popularization of staple crops like bananas, apples, grapes, and so on. But also it's about embracing foods from all around the world, which also means bigger interdependence on the supply chain. I do have to say that because I am from Mexico, a highly agricultural nation whose economy largely depends on the exports of food, the availability, climate and supply means that I can actually afford buying supreme quality produce that has been grown to perfection. And it's not only cheap, it is also available almost all year long. Now, when I am in England, for example, I always raise my eyebrows when I buy bananas from Colombia or Costa Rica, coconut from Sri Lanka and avocados from my very own Mexico. In reality, 
while middle-income countries like mine are at a disadvantage on many levels, we are less prone to face scarcity of food simply because it is wealthy nations that depend on us to have their five a day and not the other way around. B. Wilson makes a case that the widespread colonial view that thinks that poor countries for sure must have terrible diets because they are not civilized. Well, it's actually totally wrong, because just as angel-faced Scandinavians munch on their fancy smorgasbrot, in sub-Saharan Africa, native communities feast on a cornucopia of vegetables, pulses and grains that are a dietitian stream. So, in reality, the assumptions and truths of scarcity and famine are the consequence of inequality and corruption that have created an unfair and crippling concentration of wealth at the hands of too few at a great human cost of the many. On the other hand, we have all these false prophets of Western civilization that come in the shape of large corporations selling their fast food that is saturated with unhealthy oils, ridiculously big portions and a horrifying amount of salt and sugar, and they position themselves as the aspirational lifestyle that everyone should aspire to have, which of course results in the worst possible scenario. Now, when we think of a good balanced diet, Many things might come to mind of, you know, whatever we think that is. But one thing is for sure, proteins in some shape or form will be present. For most of the world population, that will mean meat. By definition, meat means animal flesh that is eaten as food. So, by definition, that includes any creature that flies, runs, crawls or swims. Now, eating meat was never an issue for primitive societies, the ancient world or prior to large-scale farming, as the seasonality and reproductive cycles well determined the supply. But industrial farming has brought deep consequences to our ecosystem, animal suffering, the use and abuse of harmful hormones and steroids to beef up animals that we ourselves end up consuming. And the last stage of the evolution of our food chain is number five, which is one that has not yet come to pass, but is hopefully taking shape. Wilson tells us that it is a future in which we shouldn't overeat, we will increase our physical activity and return to prioritize the consumption of seasonal fruits and vegetables utopian and unlikely as it might seem. We are actually provided with the wonderful example of Denmark, but I will take a step back because we actually need to talk about the whole new Nordic diet movement. I do want to point out that the groundbreaking work of Klaus Meyer, who is the man who made it possible for Noma to exist, has done extensive work together with the Danish Ministry of Health to research and implement public policy to provide high-quality food literacy and cooking skills to the population of Denmark and make it a priority to ensure that young generations are able to feed themselves adequately. It is not a Viking fairy tale. It is a real possibility for other countries to adopt policies to ensure food security for their societies. But whether we will all get there at the same time, I can absolutely guarantee to you that it won't be the case. But the fact that there are success stories out there certainly gives us hope and, more importantly, guidance. If you want to know more about that, I totally recommend a free online degree by the University of Copenhagen called The New Nordic Diet from Gastronomy to Health. I have done the course myself. It really transformed my view about food policies and social participation regarding food safety and literacy. So I will leave a link for you on the description. One of the big Oh my god, moments I had in the second chapter of the book was the way B breaks down our problem with sugar, specifically drinks. 
Now, I'm sure we are all on the same page about the fact that soft drinks are nothing but sweeteners and artificial colorings and flavors. And perhaps some of you are <laughs> too young to remember when in the 80s health advocates made it very clear with visual campaigns demonstrating how many teaspoons of sugar are in a glass of Coke and the shock it caused. Wilson makes a case that the evolutionary reason why our brains don't compute water as food and we don't perceive ourselves as being full or satisfied by only drinking is because if our ancestors would have been just happy to drink water, they would have had no chances of surviving. So therefore, being hungry for fats, craving carbs and proteins was the only way forward. And in our silly little heads, milkshakes, sodas, coffee or bubble tea aren't really food. It is okay to have as much as we want. And of course, it doesn't help the fact that in many countries, especially low-income nations, where even the most basic services like clean water is simply not available for rural areas, you will find instead a little shop that sells Coca-Cola. So in this scenario... Who is to blame for giving children fizzy pops? Are you going to blame their parents, who would rather give them that than water that will make them sick? Or should we rather blame complacent governments that let corporations take over? The next villain in this horror tale is all the hidden oil in our food. And I'm not talking about lodi tacos de carnitas, chips, burgers or cronuts. I'm talking about the oil we don't consciously choose to eat, but is in the food that was made to feed farm fish, cattle, the wax on apples at the supermarket, the trans fats and highly processed oils in snacks, confectionery, processed foods like sauces, industrialized cheeses, and even bread. And talking about bread, Wilson tells us that, according to many studies, the more affluent societies become, the less bread they eat. And what's even worse, people actually stop caring about the quality of the bread that they consume. Now, the paradigm is this. According to Engel's law, we spend less of our income on food as we get richer. But, you know, I kind of disagree with Dangles, who will probably raise from his grave and give me a lashing, because we actually do spend an awful lot more on food. And like B says, the food choices we make when we can afford it are actually also very different, and they tend to be more expensive, obviously. So, what do richer societies prefer eating if it's not bread? Well, the answer is meat. And it has been, well, the almost universal sign of wealth and power. Think of this. There is a good argument in the book about how, for centuries, pretty much since the agricultural revolution, societies had had at the core of their food system staple grains and a small group of crops. And that was it. But now the global Western diet has pushed away such staples. And the author doesn't say it, but I think that historically what staple cereals used to provide was a complex and functional diet that forced people of specific regions to make clever combinations of grains, legumes and animal foods to enrich their diet. And again, I'm going to give you another example. Take Mexico and the ancestral farming system known as milpa, where corn, beans, tomatoes, chiles and pumpkins are grown together. Eating one or two of these vegetables alone won't result in a balanced intake of nutrients. But when you combine corn, either fresh or even better, nixtamalized with beans, you create rich proteins. And if you add tomatoes and chiles, you have a bomb of vitamin D, C and A. And on top of that, if you add pumpkin, well, then you get healthy fiber and carbs. Staple crops and cereals create a structured and nutritious diet that has been pretty much the main reference, the North Star for entire civilizations. And clearly without them, we struggle to figure out how to eat and how to balance our diets. 
Another fascinating problem that is analyzed is the ever so changing use of time and how much we perceive that is worth spending on sourcing, preparing and consuming food. And it is true that historically, well, urbanization, work, schedules, commutes, increased cost of living are all factors that have shaped how we spend our time on this earth. Well, we have to carve out the time to get stuff done and earn a living. And it so happens that the first two areas that take the heat in our priorities, in our busy lives, are the time we spend on preparing food and the time we dedicate to look after our own health, that is, exercise and leisure activities and so on. So in order to buy ourselves time, we have turned to convenience food, that is, takeaways, ready-made frozen food, you name it. And it is not that we are not hungry, but we are less willing to compromise the time that can make us money for the time that can make us feel good. We outsource the feel-good reward with comfort food, and we top it up with a perpetual snacking for good measure. I really liked how B phrases the cultural and social importance of food preparation and consumption. She says, Meals are not just a way to use up time, but a series of ceremonies through which we experience time. That is a lovely quote. Let me read it again. Meals are not just a way to use up time, but a series of ceremonies through which we experience time. So it is as much about nourishment that is about conviviality. And of course, that is not a revolutionary remark by any means, but it is so important to underline the emotional impact it has in every individual to forge bonds of kinship through eating together. At the most basic level of our existence, we are social animals, and it is a very real human need to crave for the contact, intimacy, and enjoyment of conviviality. And food has, since time immemorial, been the perfect conduit for that. But I get it. And more importantly, the author gets it. And our lifestyles have changed dramatically. And there is an ever-growing number of people also who live alone, delay getting married, and even opt out from having children. That is our reality. And whether we are aware of it or not, chances are we are overcompensating certain emotional needs with food more often than we think. Allow me here to make a plug for my other podcast, Paz de Chipotle, and an interview I recorded with food blogger Douglas Collin, in which he shares the cultural shock that meant for him to eat an experienced time, uh, specifically lunch time, as a Mexican. It is a good fun episode, actually. So I will leave the link for you on the notes. All right, moving on now. One of the consequences of globalization, not only of products, after all, let's remember the largest impact occurred with the Colombian exchange in the 16th century, but the increased awareness and adoption of dishes, food preparation, techniques, and traditions boosted by digital media, that is, videos, Uh, social media networks, and even, you know, good old books, have opened up literally a world of possibilities to try and even to adopt never-before-tasted flavors, combinations, and ways of experiencing food. And if anything, that has also served, as I say on and on on Paz de Chipotle, the most tantalizing entry point to get people to open up to other cultures, other worldviews and ways of life. And, of course, that is a good thing. But the author won't let us dwell too much on this comforting thought, because the downside, she sees, it is that in our internet-obsessed Western societies, the speed and the amount of stimuli we receive 
has caused an insatiable desire to try new things all the time and embrace every ingredient and superfood that influencers and businesses throw to our faces, from goji berries to pooped coffee, avocado, chia seeds, quinoa, miso, bah, you name it. But the sharp spike in the global demand for specific ingredients, well, has come at a great cost for producing countries who go overboard to try and cope with it. Because, as B puts it, one person's trend is another person's long-held culinary tradition, and nothing has prepared them to suddenly start feeding that to millions of people every crop cycle. So what that brings is displacing other important domestic crops, deforestation, black market, and even profiteering from these in the cruelest possible way, you know, like it occurs in Mexico, where drug cartels control the market of lime and avocado. So just as there are the so-called blood diamonds, B also points the finger at blood guacamole. Another complex psychological aspect of choice are the social pressures and the constant questioning of our choices and what others assume they tell about ourselves. And that has created a huge polarization and reactionary attitudes towards, say, vegetarianism, veganism, keto, pescatarian, flexitarian, fruitarian, and any other possible combination you can think of. What it should be no one's business, the reason why we choose to follow any specific diet, somehow these converts or devotees often become radical militants and not only make it everybody's business by telling them how good or healthy or sophisticated they are for eating in a certain way, they take the trouble to tongue lash others for eating differently. And really, that's not cool, people. That really doesn't help at all. One example we are presented with um, is taking these diets to an extreme level, and that is biohacking, a term coined in Silicon Valley, of course, that messes about with our metabolism to artificially induce our body to a state of ketosis. Now, the book doesn't really explain ketosis in full detail, but I googled around for you. And it really refers to a metabolic process in which the body burns stored fats for energy that is created by intermittent fasting. So, in plain English, that means that depriving your body of food will increase your metabolism because it panics because you are not feeding your body, so it starts consuming whatever fat and energy that is stored. So one way that a group of biohackers have tackled this is by developing a formula called Soylent, which is a product that has been scientifically created to include all the nutrients that the body needs, and it's sold as uh, powders and ready-to-drink bottles. And really, that's it. Soylent is all your body will ever need to have a perfect nutrition. It is a sci-fi dream. And, you know, it's even better than an astronaut's diet. No need to cook, wash, or even spend precious time and energy chewing. I remember... Um, a while ago, actually, seeing an interview with news anchor Anderson Cooper, where he hails Soylent and lashes about his hatred for food and eating. Uh, my opinion about it is, well, first to each their own. I am actually absolutely sure that this product is a godsend blessing for thousands of people with health conditions that will get a prime nutrition from just drinking Soylent, and for others whose lifestyle and preferences are a perfect fit for it, well, good for them. But the poignant observation that the author makes is that this is the first generation to test what happens to human society when meals are removed from the equation. And not because of famine or poverty, but because we feel that food itself has failed us. The return of cooking. Now, Thankfully, we are all perfectly capable of having our own opinions and most of us can actually make some decisions for ourselves. And while many, including food journalists, 
Michael Pollan mourn the end of cooking because we don't have the time, the skills, the space, you know, whatever reason. B. Wilson has a different approach to it, one that is based on evidence, and that is that it is not really the fact that we simply have given up on cooking because we are lazy potatoes, but we are accommodating it in different ways in our lives. And actually, there is a rise in the interest for people to start cooking. And yes, even that horrendous amount of millions of cooking videos have played a good part in promoting cooking. Because one thing they do is that they have normalized cooking to one extent. And they have even made it less intimidating for many people to try it. There is a direct impact in people's lives. I mean, I lost track of the times that whenever there's a new show of Nigella Lawson cooking some whatever new dish, whichever ingredient she uses is completely sold out in a matter of days. So people actually want to cook and want to be inspired. And it is true what B points out about pollen. We can just whinge and only eat what our grandmothers would recognize as food. Because actually we're quite fortunate to eat wonderful dishes and ingredients that are delicious and nutritious that our grandmothers would have never ever had dreamed of. And personally, I don't want to give up my Marmite, lingonberry jams and squeaky halloumi. Screw my grandmas. In the case of industrialized nations, more specifically, certain heavily urbanized and wealthy regions, cooking kits and vegetables and grocery boxes have meant that, you know, while people don't want to carve out the time to go out to do some food shopping, they're happy to pay a premium to have them delivered at home and actually will make the time to cook for themselves and for their families. And this renewed enthusiasm has apparently even made cooking fun and attractive, getting the whole family involved out of their own volition. (laughs) And that is amazing and lovely for the rich suburbs. This is still an impossible scenario for working class families, rural communities and low income single parent families. And that is not because they prefer eating something else, but simply because they could never ever afford this luxury. And as for those romanticized cooking grandmothers, the truth is, as Wilson says, they often had no choice because that was their job, whether they liked it or not. It was simply non-negotiable and probably would have done many other things rather than clean up their ungrateful children and entitled husbands if only they were given the choice. And thinking about the case of nations with hailed gastronomic traditions, like Mexico, India or Italy, B throws at us two great questions. Can traditional cooking be preserved without forcing women to lead lives that few would opt for? And can we retain the benefits of traditional cooking without forcing anyone to endure the lowest status of traditional cook? The final part of the book gives us a breath of hope as we are presented with the actual implications that come with growing up and behaving like responsible people. It is time that we look at things for what they are and value the time, skill and care that anyone who decides to cook from scratch puts into making it happen, even if it's ourselves. While we can expect very little change from governments and the food industry, it is down to us, the end consumers, to put pressure on demanding fairer food systems that won't come with a trade-off of plentiful baskets for the rich and scraps for the poor. Stop throwing tantrums when governments introduce taxes on junk foods and sugar-rich products and instead see that as a sign of a real effort to try and shift things. Rethinking our living standards and perceptions about progress and prosperity, not by how much we can buy, but how good we are at making good choices and how we care for ourselves and others. This is really what the book is telling us. And it also calls for a change in policies, of course, and attitudes in the workplace and corporate practices. And I get it, it's necessary to do so because hopefully many in the position to make 
such decisions, we read this book and we'll have a change of mind. But if you are a humble average citizen like myself, well, I guess it's down to us to make as many changes as we can in our lives, beginning with treating our bodies with respect and care without affecting others. And one of my favorite things in this long list of actions that we can take is to learn to take pleasure in foods that are actually good for us. And I will also add that we must learn to enjoy doing activities that are good for us. So now we finally made it to the end of this episode and I will give you my five reasons why I think you should read this book. So here we go. Numero uno. It is a great introduction to modern food studies and a superb reading to understand the challenges of our modern food system. It is not only very well informed, well researched and uh, it is a thorough work, but it is also important because the author actually cares and is passionate about not only sharing this knowledge, but hoping to change your attitude without guilt-tripping anyone. 2. This book can potentially inspire different approaches of food anthropology, such as food heritage and identities, and will help us see, you know, the tree and the forest and value them equally. What I mean by this is not only going overboard, trying to protect heritage dishes and traditions, but also to equally empower, recognize and value the work of millions of traditional cooks, mostly women, who reproduce them. And, you know, be mature enough if they decide to walk out of the kitchen and do something else. Number three. In the land of coffee table cookery books and the comfort of beautifully filmed faceless cookery videos, we need books like this that shows and explains the best and the worst of what we've created. It is sobering, tough, but ultimately a generous book and a very compassionate work. Number four. Again, in a world where individualism and in the words of Esther Perel, a world where we are so obsessed with self-love, self-care, self-this and that, perhaps the fastest way to return to ourselves is by watching carefully the impact that our existence has in the world and how we can contribute to a shared well-being. Everything that is addressed in this book touches on our lives in many, many ways, and we should all contribute to improve it for the benefit of everyone. And number five, I think it is a great lesson to use the power of your position to have an impact on others. And, you know, I know we are not all Cambridge professors and world-leading authorities, but that is B. Wilson's platform, and she uses that. But perhaps you are a parent, or a carer, a teacher, an office employee, an entrepreneur. The point is, you have to be aware that there's always someone watching at what you do, learning from you, looking up to you, and what you do, say, and act upon matters. So be a good example for you and those around you. Ah, what an episode! I (laughs) actually didn't think this book will hit me the way it did, but I'm glad it did. I will include for you other links as well, such as a YouTube uh, video of Big Wilson talking about this book and a couple of other mm, books by her and her Twitter and Instagram accounts. She actually replies to you if you reach out. That's always nice. So share the episode on your social media, recommend it to a friend, rate it, and also get the amazing books I present by using the links I provide because for every purchase you make, I will get a little tiny percentage. So it works for everyone. The book, remember, is The Way We Eat Now, Strategies for Eating in a World of Change by B. Wilson. If you want to leave a voice message for the show telling me how much you love it, you can send it to me by using a link that I will leave in the description. And if you want, you can also connect with me on Instagram. Find the show as at Hungry Books Podcast or my other account is at rocio.carvajal. See, don't worry, links are below. And my email is hello at pasdechipotle.com. You can also make a donation to the show via buymeacoffee.com, link on this episode's notes. And in the next episode, 
I will talk about a book called The Apple Orchard: The Story of Our Most English Fruit by Pete Brown, which I really enjoyed a lot because it's pretty much an ethnographic research about the cultural aspects, traditions, and farming culture in England around apples, cider making. It's really, really full of surprises and endearing passages about the universe that are apples in England. And the best thing. <laughs> is that the author is allergic to apples. I mean, you really can't make these things up. So, stay tuned for that one. Until then, my friends, stay hungry.